Hello and welcome to Close Reading Classic Literature with me, Dr Octavia Cox. This video is for all the lost ones. Today I'm going to be analysing John Donne's beautiful holy sonnet 10, otherwise known as Death Be Not Proud. It was written in about 1609 but published posthumously in 1633. John Donne had died in 1631. It's a devotional lyric poem, lyric poem meaning that it comes from an individual speaker, an I, a speaking voice, in which John Donne's speaker directly addresses and confronts death. And today I want to explain the logic behind the imagery within John Donne's poem. For more literary analysis, do have a look at other videos on my channel and click the subscribe button so you'll know when I've published a new video, which I do every week. This is John Donne's Holy Sonnet number 10. Death, be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkst thou dost overthrow die not. Poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me. From rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be much pleasure, then from thee much more must flow. And soonest our best men with thee do go, rest of their bones and souls delivery. Thou art a slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men, and dost with poison, war, and sickness dwell, and poppy or charms can make us sleep as well and better than thy stroke. Why swellest thou then? One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death Thou shalt die. I'm now going to go through the poem section by section, line by line, and unpick it in a little bit more detail. So the opening couple of lines. Death, be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. The poem is an apostrophe to death. An apostrophe is a rhetorical device where the speaker directly and pointedly addresses a particular thing or person. In Holy Sonnet 10, John Donne's speaker anthropomorphizes death, so gives death human characteristics to this non-human thing, in this case pride. So death be not proud. It's an apostrophe to death, the speaker is speaking directly to death, essentially here is confronting death by having death be the first word in the poem. There's an irony too, of course, here in the very opening, because death is proud and pride, of course, is a deadly sin. So there's a little sort of joke even there in the opening couple of words. So death is proud, self-aggrandizing and arrogant because death has taken on the fact that some people think death is mighty and dreadful. That essentially is death's power, that fear from people who think that death is mighty and dreadful. But John Donne's speaker is going to dispute death's power and therefore misplaced pride and show why death's pride is misplaced. The language is plain, straightforward and logical. It's set out as a logical argument rather than a poem in flowery rhetoric. And this is the first line of the argument really after that introductory couple of lines we've just had. For those whom thou thinkst thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me. Death thinks that it is powerful because it thinks it overthrows people. But death is wrong in its thinking. Death is logically wrong, the speaker suggests, and the speaker will defeat death with logic. 
John Donne's speaker's argument is that death thinks it overpowers people, but people actually don't die in the way that death thinks people die. All death brings is a false death. John Donne's speaker is assertive in the face of death, nor yet canst thou kill me. Although there is some doubt, I think, in the use of the word yet there, nor yet canst thou kill me. An acknowledgement that one day death will kill the speaker. But the speaker doesn't see that as something to fear. It isn't mighty and dreadful. And the speaker will go on to explain why in the rest of the poem. In fact, John Donne's speaker pities death, poor death, because it is misguided and it doesn't understand that death, in fact, achieves the opposite of what it thinks it achieves. And the speaker then goes on to explain why this is the case. From rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be much pleasure then from thee much more must flow. And you can see that this is constructed as a logical argument. If the first part of the sentence, then this must happen as a result, then much more must flow. So John Donne's speaker compares death to rest and sleep, which are but mere pictures of death. So they are only likenesses, they are only copies. Rest and sleep are like copies of death, they're sketches of death in the way that a drawing copies real life. But rest and sleep bring much pleasure. When one wakes from rest and sleep, one feels refreshed and revived. In fact, it makes one feel more awake and more alive. So the logical argument then is that if rest and sleep which are but mere pictures of death, are only copies of death. If rest and sleep can bring so much life-affirming pleasure, then imagine how much more pleasure must flow from death. Because death brings a much more vivid, real-life version of rest and sleep, rather than being just a picture. Notice that the monosyllables with elongated vowel sounds in those words, much more must flow. It slows down the line and makes John Donne's speaker sound assertive and in control. And it's an imperative, must, much more must flow. There's no doubt from the speaker. And we also have repetition. So much pleasure, much more. That repetition highlights the assertive nature of the speaker and links those two parts of the sentence, much pleasure, much more, from the if part of the sentence and the conclusion, the then part of the sentence. Death, John Donne's speaker argues, must be even more pleasurable, therefore, than rest and sleep. And soonest our best men with thee do go, rest of their bones and soul's delivery. So our best men with thee do go. Again, we're going back into the earlier part of the poem, back to the idea of power and whether or not death overthrows anyone as death thinks it does. Death thinks it has power because it thinks it overthrows people. And the speaker here is saying that men go with thee. The image of best men going with death suggests that they choose to enter into a relationship with death, a relationship which leads to their bones and bodies resting and the delivery of their soul to heaven. There is no power struggle here. These best men move through death, use death, to get to eternity, to their soul's freedom. Death, then, is a mere means to a greater end. And these best men choose to go with death to achieve this greater end. So we've now read the first 
octet, the first part of the poem called the octet, which is eight lines, and then the sestet comes after, which is six lines. This is a traditional Petrarchan sonnet form where you start off with the octet and you conclude with the sestet. In the middle of those two is the volta or turn, which we're now at. The idea of the structure is that you set out a position in the octet, as John Donne's speaker has here. There's then a turn, a volta, and then the sestet reflects back on what has already been said in the octet. So here in this poem, Holy Sonnet 10, in the octet, John Donne's speaker punctures death's idea that it has power over those it encounters. That poor death does not, in fact, overthrow people in the way it thinks it does. The sestet begins thou. Again, directly addressing and personifying death. John Donne's speaker is now going to say what death actually is. So the octet has punctured death's idea of itself as mighty and dreadful. And the sestet, the speaker is going to go on and describe how the speaker actually sees death in contrast to the people who think that death is mighty and dreadful. In the opening line, John Donne's speaker says that others have called thee mighty and dreadful. John Donne's speaker is now going to undermine that idea and expose the opposite. That is the powerlessness and the pitifulness of death. Thou art slave to fate, chance, kings and desperate men. So death thinks it is powerful, it thinks it is master, but in fact it is a mere slave to worldly to earthly happenstance. Death is controlled, is overthrown, in fact, by fortune and luck, by rulers and desperate people, the reckless, the careless, the wretched, pitiful people. And dust with poison war and sickness dwell. Poison, war and sickness are ignoble bedfellows. John Donne uses the word dwell here. It alludes to the theme of power. Death thinks it overthrows with power, but actually it dwells, it lives with, it cohabits with these rather ignoble earthly concerns. Death actually is rather parochial and earthbound. And death remains thinking of earthly things like poison, war and sickness, while the people who use death and go through death have their souls delivery, are released and get to go to heaven, while death has to stay on earth, dwelling with these unpleasant earthly things. And poppy or charms can make us sleep as well and better than thy stroke. Poppies mean opium and charms are magic spells, enchantments. So John Donne's speaker here is saying that drugs and magic are just as good, if not better, than death at procuring sleep. So death is not even very exceptional at producing sleep. Why swellest thou then? So John Donne's speaker asks death a rhetorical question. Given all this, why are you so swelled with pride? Why do you puff yourself up as something special? What have you got to be proud of? One short sleep past, we wake eternally and death shall be no more. Death is nothing but a mere short sleep between people's earthly lives and waking in the eternal afterlife. And death shall be no more, after which death can be forgotten, can be overthrown by people. In fact, it's the people who die who have the power because they overthrow death when they get to go to heaven. When you die, you don't even have to think about death anymore. But death is left behind on earth. Death shall be no more. It's no longer a concern to people who have died. Death, thou shalt die. So again, we've got the speaker being very assertive, using strong monosyllables with elongated vowel sounds. Thou shalt die. 
The idea here is that the speaker is saying that death's pride shall die. The image of death as mighty and dreadful will die as a result of the poem and the logic of the poem. Death's imagined power over humans, that people are scared of death, it is that which will die. And here John Donne alludes to 1 Corinthians 15, 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Death will be destroyed as an enemy because its imagined power has been exposed as false. Death is not an enemy because it has no power to harm you ultimately. Death is a mere vessel through which we achieve the soul's freedom. It is death which is to be pitied because death will never find that freedom. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Remember, if you like what I do here on my channel, then do subscribe for weekly updates. Give the video a big thumbs up by hitting the like button and let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Are you convinced by John Donne's logic in arguing that death has nothing to be proud of?